right, good morning. Good morning. Grab your Bibles. We're going to um, do something a little different from our normal, but pretty normal for a brand new year. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a little bit. Uh, you know, at the start of the new year, we do a couple of things. Number one, we lay out our vision for the next year. And we're, I'm going to do that again uh, this morning, talk about kind of what, what are our goals, what's our vision for this upcoming year as a church body. Um, and then we're going to launch, um, and then the second thing we typically do is launching a new year challenge. Like last year, we did the New Testament challenge. Um, we've walked through some books together, done those kinds of things. And uh, this year's no different. So I'm going to kind of start at the very top and walk through this. So this morning is going to be a little bit different, right? A little less preaching, teaching, a little more casting of vision, sharing with you what's on my heart, our leadership's heart, kind of where we're going. And, and I have two confessions for you this morning. Are, are you ready for confession time? Yep. Number one, I got to confess that as a pastor, I clearly need to have more faith because we had more chairs than this set up and, and I took them down because I was convinced people were going to be at home sleeping. Um, so thank you for coming this morning. It's, it's, it's good. It's always better. Now, I am a little sad. This area is a little dark this morning because we found out that there's a light bulb out over there. So that's not, we're not saying anything about you as a group, okay? Um, so that's my first confession. Uh, my second confession um, is that I'm not a very good, um, what's the right word? I, I don't, it's not that I don't cast vision. I'm not one of those raw, raw kind of guys, right? You ever meet those guys that, you know, and women, you get around them, they just inspire you to like jump through walls, Anyone ever had a coach like that or a teacher like that? Yeah, that's, that's probably not me. That's not my greatest skill set. My skill set is teaching God's word and helping people understand what it is. But this morning, I'm going to try and cast some vision. Um, and, but, and so we're going to talk about our mission, our vision as a church, what those things mean. But before we do that, I want you to grab your Bibles because we need to take half a step back, okay? So I want you to grab your Bibles and first turn to Matthew chapter 22. Now, the, the, the verses we're going to read here are nothing new. They're verses you've heard before. You've heard me teach on these verses. Um, and they have a name. Um, each one of these individually has a name. We're going to talk about the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And together, kind of in church circles, you'll often hear them referred to as GC squared. Because they both, it's great. They both start with a G and they both start with a C. So you, Jesus gives us both the great commandment and the great commission. So which one are we starting with? All right, the great commandment. And this applies to all Christ followers. So if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this applies to you. So we're going to pick it up uh, starting in verse 34. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees with his reply... They met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. By the way, anytime you read in scripture that someone is trying to trap Jesus, pay attention because it's about to get funny. The question was, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, if we back up half a step, what's wrong with this question? Yeah, yeah, is it the law of Moses? Well, that's what they called it, right? Because Moses gave it to them. So th they knew what they were talking about. Any other thoughts? <coughs> it's kind of a silly question. God gives you ten commandments. What had you better do? Follow the ten. Right? This idea of hierarchy is kind of interesting. But Jesus replies. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. All right, so very simply, what is the, the commission, the, the commandment that God has given us as Christ followers? What are we to do? Love God and love other people. That, that's the base command for all of us. And if you're not doing that, that means you're being disobedient. 
And we don't want to be that. So we love God. We love one another. We love the people around us. That's our great commandment. That applies to everyone who follows Christ. Okay? Now let's turn a, a few chapters to Matthew chapter 28. This is called the Great Commission. This is at the end after Jesus has risen. <clears throat> He's come back. He's talking to his disciples. And it's the very last thing that Matthew shares with us that Jesus, uh, that Jesus tells his, his disciples. Pick it in verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, now if you've been to the Bible class, when you see the word therefore, what should you ask? What is the therefore? Therefore. Why does Jesus say therefore? It connects what he's about to say to what he just said, right? So what did he just say? He has all authority. What does that matter? Why, why is that important? He's the boss. Yeah. Why does that matter to us? Therefore, so what? It proves his deity, yeah. It legitimizes them. It legitimizes him, for sure. No, it's them. It's oh, them, yes, yes. He, he has the ability to pass it on. Yes. All of that is true. I think the one additional thing I would add is, see, he's about to tell us to go and make disciples of all nations. And that's kind of terrifying, isn't it? And we may be worried and sure, well, people will make fun of me or people will do things, and he's saying, listen, I want you to understand that I'm, I'm in control. I'm in control. I have all authority, and you're going in my name. And I do have authority, and I can pass it on to you. And I am commissioning you. I'm giving you that same authority. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always. This, commi this, this commission also applies to who? All to all Christ followers. He's giving this commission to his disciples and he's giving it to us, all of his disciples. And it's very simple. What are we to do? There's several things he tells us to do. Go, make disciples, baptize those disciples and then one more thing teach them teach those disciples to obey all the commandments that i have given you which is another circle right because we just talked about the great commandment so what's the commandment what are you supposed to teach him to love god to love one another and then to go have those disciples go and make more disciples right it's very simple isn't it i mean jesus makes it as about as simple as it can possibly be he says, I want you to love one another and love God. And, and, and in that process, I want you to live that out. The way you do that is by making disciples, sharing the gospel, baptizing those who accept Christ, and then teaching those disciples all the commandments of God. Simple, easy peasy, right? Yeah, okay. Well, as a church, our mission comes straight from that. And so it's important that you understand, we're, we're not overriding the Great Commission or the Great Commandment. Uh, the, that is for all of us. Our mission as a church answers the question, why do we as a church body exist? Right? Do you know how many churches there are in like a 20-mile radius of Pinecrest? I don't either, but a lot. If there's a road in Parker, you can drive down and there are 16 churches in about a two-mile span. A lot of churches around. Right? So the question is not why are we better than somebody else? The question is what is it God has called, uniquely called us to do here? Why are we here? Why do we exist? And in its simplest form, there's three statements uh, you can put into your memory bank. All right? Number one is love the Lord. Now, where did we get that? Yeah, straight out of the Bible. We're to love the Lord and as an extension, love one another. We're to love. That should be the, the hallmark. When people look at Pinecrest, they should say, those people love. They love God. They love one another. They care for one another. It should be in, in a hallmark. 
The second thing we exist, the reason we exist is to learn the Bible. We want to learn this book. Why is it important that we learn this book? So we know what it says, so we can know him. Yep, all that's true. Teach others. Remember the great commandment? What does he say at the very end? Teach those new disciples to obey the commandments that I've given you. But you kind of got to know this if you want to teach it to other people. I say, Pastor, again, and you may be thinking, Pastor, this is all great. But so far, everything you've talked about, that's why we have you and Jake and Amy. No, that's not it. We are all supposed to be, remember that commandment and that commission was given to who? All of us. So we as a church exist to help you learn the Bible. And to have a place where you can learn and grow in your relationship with God. Third thing is we're to live the gospel. Live the gospel. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Okay, what is the gospel? We're going to talk about what the gospel is. And if, if you've been here for the last three, four months, you're probably sick of hearing about it. I'm going to talk about it a little bit different way, okay? I, I, I read a thing this morning that um, if you're taking notes, you should put this down or put it in your memory bank, maybe put it in your phone. It said, one of the questions that Christians need to be an asking, answering, we've been asking the wrong question. I said, we, a lot of Christians ask or think about what they've been saved from. All right, what have we been saved from as Christ followers? Death, eternal death, right? The wages of sin is death. That's what we've been saved from. But is that really what we should be focused on? Now, the question really should be, what are we saved for? And we know what we've been saved from, but why? Now that we're saved, how should we be living our life? What should we be living for? And our answer is, you, you are saved so that you can love God, you can worship Him, you can love one another, take care of His creation, you can learn His Word for yourself and for the people around you, and you can live the gospel of Jesus Christ out in your everyday life. Okay? Pretty clear, right? Pretty simple. And we're going to continue to give you methods and, and modes. I mean, if you want to learn the Bible, what are some of the things you can do? Go to the Bible class. Go to the, the beliefs class. Uh, we're developing a couple more classes coming up to help you live this out in a very real way. Uh, how can you love God and love one another? What's that? Through missions. Through missions, yep. Serving, right. You can serve here. Find an opportunity, something that captures your heart, and, and, and find a way to serve, okay? So there's all kinds of ways for us as a church body. We are here. The reason we exist is to help people love God, learn the Bible, and live the gospel in their lives every single day. Next question is, okay, you get mission, and then what else? What goes with it? You know what goes with it? Vision. And vision is, where are we going? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? So everyone's got a card like this on your seat, right? And if you don't have one, there's one close to you, so steal somebody else's. And they may have, someone's got it in their hand. All right, and I, sh I shared this. This was a vision I shared last year. A vision that God laid on our heart, on our leadership. It's kind of saying, okay, how will we know if we've accomplished what God is calling us to do? In both the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, and our mission as a church. And I laid out three things that I believe God is calling us to do. What's number one? You can read it. 100 new, not new believers, baptism. new believer baptisms by 2026. So it was in five years when I laid, when I began to lay this out. I said the next five years and five years would be in 2026. Can you believe that's how fast time is going by, by the way? So, how are we doing? Any idea? How many baptisms did we do in 2022? 200! I like his faith. He's not even close. Seven? Higher? We'll, we'll do the uh, prices right game. Ten? Higher? Lower than 25? Lower? Higher than 12? 15. And yeah, we did 15 baptisms in 2023. Okay, what does that tell us? Yeah, we have more to go. But if you're, if you're a math person, you divide 100 by 5. How many is that a year? 
20, which means close. Right? Here's, here's the challenge for us. How many did we do in the last quarter of 2023? Zero. All right? This, this baptismal has been sitting here for the entire year, literally since the beginning of 2022, and it has not seen the light of day for three months. I hope that hurts your heart because it hurts mine. And, and I feel responsible for that. Now you say, Pastor, how can we do that? How can we get to 100 new believers? Uh, look around the room. How many people are in this room? Mom, how many people are in this room? 147 people in this room. Okay? If each one of us just did what Jesus called us to do and make, make a disciple, how many baptisms would we have? 147. Last I checked... 147 was bigger than 100, right? So this seems like a really big goal, but is it unattainable? No. What do we need to do? Yeah, just be obedient. Just do what Jesus called us to do, right? Now, what do you think back in 2022, right? We're setting goals for 2023. How many times in this last year, you don't, don't answer this out loud. How many times in this last year did you share your faith, share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody in your life? I don't know about you, but I don't like my number. So we're going to do better at that. And we're going to continue to do better as a community, okay? Now, I, I share that not to make us feel bad. Remember, I'm not very good at the rah-rah thing, but I want us to know where we stand. And God has called us to do these things, and I believe that we can do them. All right, what's number two on the list? Five new missionaries into the mission field. How many have we sent? Zero. Now, here's the, right, I didn't expect us to send five in a year. This one's going to take some time, and, you know, we've had some challenges. We haven't even been able to get into the mission field in the last three years. Literally, the trip that we're taking here in 10 days is the first trip in, like, three years. So uh, I just believe that as a result of these trips and us bringing missionaries in to share the work that they're doing, that God is going to lay on your heart a call into the mission field, whether that be locally or somewhere around the world. And you just know I'm praying for that. And when God hits you over the head with a clue by four, you can blame me. All right? Number three. Three new missionally driven and team-led ministries. How many have we started? Three. Three in this last year. That number clearly is not big enough. Right? But that's great news. We had Embrace Grace. Kind of get restarted, relaunched this year. and We've made a difference in, in, in new moms, single moms' lives. We helped a single mom just at, in, the, in, in December, right before Christmas, pay her rent so that she and her baby didn't get kicked out. That's a very tangible thing. But we're also like, yeah. How many moms have we helped this last year? You, got, you have any idea? Just a ballpark. Yeah, four or five moms, single moms that we've loved on and cared for. Moms who made a decision in the hardest part of their lives to keep a child. And we've come alongside them and said, we want to support you in this process. We want you to know that God honors and blesses the decision that you've made. And we're going to come alongside and help you in that process. That's, that's fantastic. That's awesome. And we're going to continue to do that in this next year. We also had our volunteer core get launched this year. Our volunteer, our visitation core get launched this year. And there are a lot of people in this community that need people who, to come and visit them. Just to, to reach out with a phone call or a card or someone to come along, come in to, into, their, into, into a nursing home or a hospital bed or into their homes because they can't get out and just say, look, we see you, we love you, we care about you. It's important. All right? And the third is our uh, wood ministry. What do, we, what do we call it? Give me the official name. Community Wood Bank. Community Wood Bank. That's right. Our community wood bank uh, and literally helping you gathering firewood and helping people in our community who can't afford to heat their homes, giving them firewood uh, to, to heat their homes. That's three new ministries this year. That's fantastic. And it's externally focused on people who need it. We're going to continue to do that. So maybe it should say three new missionally driven and team led ministries every year. We'll see. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and then the bottom there is just some of the ways that we're talking about doing that, being involved in groups, serving, learning, 
uh, serving, giving, learning, missions, being fully resourced for ministry. And I want to tell you, I want you to be praying about something you're going to be hearing about here so shortly. This year, I'm going to add one thing kind of to this fully resourced ministry that I am convinced God is going to allow us to do. And that is to pay off our $1 million debt on this property. And God is already paving the way for most of that to happen. Uh, we believe here in the next month that about two-thirds of our debt will be gone without asking you for a penny. That's fantastic. Yeah. But guess who's going to get rid of that last third? We are. Get ready to sacrifice your Starbucks for the month. Your McDonald's or something, right? Because I believe God wants us to be debt-free because he didn't want us to get into debt in the first place. God's in the business of getting us out of debt. And, and as soon as we get out of debt, we'll, we'll be able to hire somebody. And until that happens, we're not going to hire anyone. All right? Sound good? good. All right. So that's kind of the vision. That's what God's asking us to do. So the next question is, what's our strategy for accomplishing that? How are we going to do this? And if you notice, we have... We've kind of um, refocused and recentered everything we do here around one thing. What is that one thing? No. No. Oh, you know what this tells me? We have not said it enough. It's the gospel. Everything we're doing is recentering. And by the way, those things that you said, so if those things are wrong, the question is how are we going to accomplish the things that God has called us to do, we are refocusing and re-energizing and putting all of our attention into being a gospel-centered church. Meaning we're not trying to do things, and we've been guilty of this, and a lot of churches are guilty of this, of doing things to attract people into the church. It's called the attractional model, right? Have the right music, have the right show, have the right speaker, have the best children's ministry, have the best coffee, make sure you've got a barista out there, and do all the things that help people come and sit in churches. The problem is, we found out that you know who that model attracts? Consumers. Two things. Consumers, but what kind of consumers? Christian consumers. None of that attracts non-Christians. They don't come in because they got a great show. Other Christians do. In fact, we found out what's happening is you're just poaching from other churches. Well, that's not what we want to be about. I didn't say go steal uh, disciples from the church down the road. He said go make new disciples. And the way you make new disciples is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody has ever come to faith because of a song that I sung or a sermon that I wrote unless that sermon or song was about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am fairly convinced nobody has ever come to Christ through a barista in a church unless that barista was doing what? Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, we we're talking about bringing coffee back. But it's going to be coffee with a purpose, not coffee because you want coffee. And I notice you all have found out that there's Starbucks in the world. And you come in with your own coffee. Isn't that weird? But you know what Starbucks doesn't serve? The gospel. All right. So we're going to refocus ourselves. So let's talk about just real quickly. I, I know there's a football game starting at 11 o'clock. There's several of them, right? First of all, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be late to that game. Second of all, I'm going to tell you, the Broncos are going to lose anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> the only question is, how badly are they going to lose? Uh, and, and Seattle's just laughing all the way to the bank. So what is the gospel of Jesus Christ anyway? And we've been talking about it. I talked about this in the last quarter of last year. right? What is the Greek word for gospel? It's the Greek word I have a tough time saying. Euangelion. It means to proclaim the good news. In fact, in your Bible, it'll either say gospel or good news. That word gets translated uh, both ways. But we're not going to get into the technical details of what the gospel is this morning. Uh, we're going to come back to the third part of our vision, which is to live the gospel. What does that mean to live the gospel? In fact, when you hear that phrase, does it make you think, I, that doesn't make any sense. When you think about the gospel, what verbs do you usually associate with it? Share, preach, teach, 
Right? That's all about getting it out, right? Now, should we be sharing, preaching, teaching, proclaiming the gospel? Yes. What's the difference between doing that and actually living the gospel? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Grab your Bibles. I'm going to, we're going to share, talk about three things that living the gospel means. Turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to be in Romans the whole time. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of this good news. What's that word, good news? The gospel. I'm not ashamed of this gospel about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. All right, and as I'm reading this, I'm preparing uh, in March, we're going to start a brand new series that's going to last through the rest of the year, walking through the book of Romans together. So you've got to prepare yourself for that. And, and as I'm reading that, why is he talking about the Jew first and also the Gentile? We're going to get to that. But what is, it, what is the gospel here? What? How would you describe the gospel? What does this verse say the gospel is? The power of God at work to do what? Save. To save. So the gospel is our salvation. We are saved through the gospel. It is the power of God working in us to save us. But that's only the start, right? We all get that. I mean, that's a great... Everyone go, duh. No, seriously. Duh. Right? We all knew that. We know that's what the gospel is. The gospel saves us, right? That's obvious. But it doesn't end there. But for some of us, that is where it ends. We say, okay, I've been saved from eternal damnation. I've been saved from death. I'm good. I got my fire insurance. I'm saved. Remember, we're not asking, what are we saved from? What are we saved for? So I want you to turn. We're going to keep reading, though. You don't even have to turn. Verse 17 uh, and did I say 18? Yep, 17 and 18. This, what's the word? Good news or gospel tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sin, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Not only is this good news about our salvation, it is about our sanctification. Amen. Okay, good. I got, a lot, I got a blank stares. What's the big question you have on your mind? And if you've got it, just shout it out because you're not the only one, I promise you. Yeah, what is sanctification? What's the difference between salvation and sanctification? There's a big difference. And the gospel is... is key to both of them. What is salvation? Righteousness from God. Right. You, you've been saved from God. There's this moment where this decision is made for him and he, he bestows his grace upon you. What is sanctification? That's a moment in time, right? What is sanctification? It's living that out every single day. It's the grace of God coming into your life on a consistent basis. It's us continually exchanging our sin for his righteousness. I don't know if you know this, but you need that every second of every day. And it is the gospel. See, we get this idea that the gospel, that saves people. Not only does it save people, it keeps them. It empowers them. It strengthens them. It's, it allows us to live for him every day by his power to follow his commands. What sanctification really says is, this is not the end. Salvation is not the finish line for Christ followers. It's the starting line. And we've got a long race ahead of us. And we're going to be doing some things while we're doing that. How? Here's the thing. If we talk about, and the third thing, by the way, is sharing the gospel with others. How do we do that? Is it scary to share the gospel? Just be honest. Yeah. I mean, you're in church. We don't want anyone to get struck by lightning. 
Is it scary to share the gospel? Is that terror, that fear, the primary reason you don't share the gospel? Again, we're in church. Be honest. Yeah. That's true for all of us. I mean, either one of three things is true. Why we're not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Because let, let me just ask you this. Would, for everyone in this room who knows Jesus, would you say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the single most important thing you've ever been introduced to and is the single greatest thing impacting your life on a daily basis? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Then why aren't you sharing that with people? Why aren't, why aren't we sharing it like with everybody? I watched the video as part of our mission trip, um, and, and, and I, I should have shown it, but I didn't see it in time, so I'll just tell you. It's this guy in a canoe, and he's sleeping in the canoe, right? And he's going down this lazy river, and, and then it switches and shows a picture of this old dude sitting on the, on the side of the riverbank with his canoe, and he sees the canoe drifting by, and he, he about says something, but then he's like, ah, nah. And then the picture continues to pan, and you see that the canoe is headed for a waterfall. And there's a sign that says, disembark your canoe here. And the guy doesn't do anything. He just lets the guy go. What would we say about someone like that? What would we say about someone like that? Hmm? Selfish. Jerk. Maybe a little bit of a psychopath. Right? What should he have done? What are some things he should have done? He should have yelled? Thrown a rock? Dove in to help the guy? Done something? And I think God is saying that same thing. I want you to do something. I want you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The single most important thing in your life. Not just one moment in time, but in every single day of your life. And you're not sharing that with the people around you. And why is that? Because we're terrified. We're scared to do it. <coughs> so, here's our tactic for this year. And I don't say any of that to do anything, but maybe to light a little bit of fire under you. And one of two things, by the way, is going to happen as a result of this next year. You're either going to use your consumer power as a Christ follower yeah. and go somewhere else. Or God's going to light you on fire and you're going to become something that you didn't think you could be. Because our first tactic for this year, if we're to share the gospel and I know we're not doing it. And you know how I know we're not doing it? Yeah, see, because we didn't have 100 baptisms. That's one way. There's a bigger way. It's confession number three. I'm not doing it either. We're not doing it. God's church is not doing it. In fact, I've had to ask myself. I had a guy ask me this week. Um, some of you know I started kind of a side hustle, uh, repairing furniture. One of the reasons, maybe not the primary reason, but one of the reasons, and it's becoming the most important is, as a pastor, you know who I hang around with 99% of the time? Christians. I mean, it's my job, right? I'm supposed to hang around with you all. Whether I like you or not, I'm supposed to hang out with you. But the question, then the question is, then who am I sharing my faith with? And a lot of pastors will say, well, that's everyone else's job. You're supposed to bring them in here, and that's where I share the gospel with them. But that's not the model that Jesus gives us. He says, I want you to go make disciples in your life. So where do I do that? Well, I'm starting to think through... Well, you know, I got clients and customers come in to ask me to help repair their furniture. And one of the ways that I begin to have these conversations is, you know, one of the reasons I help restore furniture is because I believe that God likes to bring new things, old things, broken things back to life. And it creates an opportunity for me to build a relationship and start to share the gospel. But I haven't been doing that. And if I'm not doing it, how do I ask you to do it? We're all going to start to do this. So the very first series at the beginning of this year is about evangelism training because the church exists to equip and train you. 
And we're, we're going to have an evangelism course. But here's what I know about me doing the course. Let's say we create an evangelism course and I offered it up. How many people would show up? Yeah, somewhere between 1 and 10. That's typically what we get. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a great class size. But again, how many people are in this room? 147. Which means I'm going to, you know, that's less than 10%. And I'm not even good at math. We all need to have these tactics. And, and I even hate to use the word tactic. We need to be trained and equipped for how do we share our faith and get over that fear that keeps us from sharing our faith. Because here's what I know. I know there's nobody in this room who's just like, absolutely not, I'm not going to do it because I don't even like Jesus and I don't want to share him. It's about this fear. I don't know what to say. What will they think? What about when they ask me some questions that I don't know? I don't know. They ask the question. I have no idea. And by the way, you know what the, your favorite three words are? I don't know. But I'll ask. I know that's six words, but it's in two parts. All right. So we've got this class coming, but we're going to launch it here on Sundays. We're going to start next week. And the, found, the book, the foundation of everything we're going to teach, if you want to get this book, you can. Uh, it's not necessary. We're going to talk through the principles in this book. It's a book called Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out. <laughs> Evangelism, the way you were born to do it. And there's, this isn't about teaching you like the Romans Road or you know, other methods for sharing the gospel. This really is about how do you get over your fear of sharing the gospel, stop freaking out about it, and find some passion and desire to share the gospel. Wouldn't you like that? And we'll talk through some very basic principles about what is effective and what is not effective. And by the way, what was effective 20 years ago, not so effective today. And so we got to think through what is our culture like? What, is our, what are the questions our culture is asking? We're going to walk through all of those things. All right? Sound good? This is up to all of us. And by the way, this is biblically sound. Right? It comes right on the back of the Great Commission and the Great Commandments. I can't think of a more unloving thing to do than to build a relationship with somebody and never talk to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's kind of mean. Letting them go over the waterfall with a canoe. But maybe you can't swim. Maybe the cat has your tongue. We're going we're gonna to loosen it. Sound good? All right, let's stand together. And let's pray. Father God, we thank you first of all for the gospel of Jesus Christ that has made such an impact in our lives. Now we can think back to a moment where it changed us and shaped us and we can see every single day how the gospel is helping us to become more like your son, how your spirit, through the power of Jesus Christ, identifies sin in our lives, areas where we need to grow, and then helps us with those things. And Father, I just pray that I know everyone in this room has a heart and a desire to share the gospel with the people around us. But either we don't know or we're just flat out afraid of how to do it. We're afraid of what people might think of us. We're afraid of what uh, they might say, how they might come at us. We're afraid of the questions they might ask. But Father, I pray that you begin even now to shape and challenge us to think differently about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. To remove our fear, because your word says you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So we're going to receive your power. We're going to receive your love and we're going to have the discipline it takes to do the things you've called us to do because you have all authority and you've given us that authority. There is no fear. We should not be afraid, but Father, we are. So help begin to change and transform that in us. Challenge us, convict us, place a burning and a desire and a passion in our hearts to share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that, there is, so that we get to a point where we can do nothing else. Father, give us a great day today. Thank you for a brand new year and all the possibilities that it provides. And, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great day. If you would help us out.
stack chairs in groups of seven, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Happy New Year.